Okay, if you have your Bibles, open to the book of John, chapter 14. Uh, I've been preaching a series called This is the Holy Spirit. Still in the book of John. I, I preached for seven weeks from the book of John on This is Jesus and talked about his identity as John portrays it. And so now I wanted to take three these three Sundays leading up to uh, Pentecost Sunday and deal with this subject, This is the Holy Spirit. And man, it got good this morning. So I'm still on the overflow right now, all right? So listen, y'all have nowhere to go. Don't run off on me. Hot dogs and hamburgers, that's what you got waiting on you, folks. You got all the rest of the weekend and tomorrow off, hopefully. John chapter 14, verse 15. Let's begin there. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I've gone through in my Bible and highlighted all the personal pronouns, he and him, there. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, not an impersonal force. And he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. I will come to you, Jesus says, verse 18. Verse 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, and you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Wow. Can we say amen? I want to, I want to look especially at verse 16. I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper. Now I'm reading the New King James Version, which has, these translators have chosen to translate that beautiful Greek word there as helper. If you look in the NASB, it's the same. Helper. However, if you look into the Old King James, it's comforter. Those translators chose the word comforter. If you look into Eugene Peterson's The Message, he chose to use the word friend. Or if you look into J.B. Phillips, who's a very good Greek scholar, his New Testament translation, he says, someone else to stand by you. And then if you look into the NLT, NIV translation, it has this word, and this is what I'm going to choose because it's my favorite, advocate. Advocate. So what happens when we have translators taking a term like this and giving us so many variants on it? What we have, people, is a very rich word. When you have that many variations of it, it means you're dealing with a very rich original term that it's going to take a lot of work to describe just all the goodness that's in it. Okay? So the Holy Spirit is called the Advocate. What is an Advocate? An Advocate is a helper, one who comes alongside, or the most just down-to-earth way I could put it, he's a lawyer. He's an attorney. An advocate is a lawyer or an attorney because the Jewish idea behind this text is that there's a great courtroom of heaven. And in the courtroom of heaven, Satan is there, according to Job 1, Satan is there accusing me and you, accusing the believer. And in the courtroom of heaven, we need an advocate. Can you say amen? So judicial advocacy in a courtroom is really what's being looked at here. And the, the Greek term breaks apart in para and kaleo, which means to, uh, to come or to be with and then alongside. So the advocate or the comforter or the helper is one who is called 
to come with us and walk alongside us. Look at it. What's a lawyer really paid to do? He or she is paid to come and walk with you and walk into the courtroom with you and represent you. You don't have to speak. You just have to be there in person, but it's just like you weren't there because the, the, the court's going to hear the attorney. He's going to speak. He's going to plead. He's going to take the... He's going to take the floor. He's going to persuade. He's the one who is acting on your behalf. If he wins, you win. If he's good, you're good. If he's bad, you're in trouble. Right? It's the way of an attorney and it's the way the court system rolls. Notice what Jesus said in John 15, 26. But the helper or advocate... But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. Jesus said, this guy is coming to speak about Me. And He's going to testify of Me. On down in one more passage, John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Advocate or Helper will not come to you. But if I do depart, I'm going to send him to you. And when he comes, he's going to do this. He's going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when he... The Spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, for He will speak on His own, not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. Hallelujah. Can you thank God for the Helper or the Comforter right now? Come on, how many is thankful to have an Advocate right now? Okay, there's a couple of Old Testament examples. I'm just going to just define this and pave it, and y'all hang on with me. There's a couple of examples from the Old Testament I want to give you. First of all, it's from the life of Abraham. Abraham became a helper or an advocate for his nephew Lot in Genesis chapter 18. The scenario is God appears to Abraham and appears to him at his tent door, and then Abraham invites him in and cooks dinner for him. And then after that is over, he goes and he's leaving. And as God is leaving, he stops and says, Hey, can I hide what we're doing from, from Abraham? Because God was going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to, to judge the sin that was there. And then, of course, we know God eventually destroyed those cities. And so he stopped and he lets Abraham in on the plan. And what's Abraham do? Abraham runs out and he says, No, hold, hold on. Hold on, Lord. And he stands between God and Sodom and Gomorrah. Or he stands between God and his nephew. And he says, listen, listen, listen. You can't destroy that city. My nephew's in that city. And, uh, and then he starts a bargaining process. And he starts bargaining with God. Listen, listen, listen. If you found so many righteous in that city, would you, would you destroy it? And, and, he, and he works this and he whittles it all the way down to where he says, listen, if, if there were 50 righteous in the city... Would you destroy the city if there were 50 righteous? And the Lord says, well, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I'll spare all the place. And he whittles him on down. This is just an excerpt from it. What is Abraham doing here? Abraham is acting as an advocate for his nephew. You know what he's really doing? He's interceding for his nephew. You know what intercession is? Intercession involves prayer. But intercession is standing between heaven and earth. Standing between your loved ones and impending judgment. Standing before the face of God. Praying for somebody. Another scenario happens in Genesis chapter 20. Abraham and Sarah go down to the kingdom of Abimelech. And when they go there, Abraham's afraid to tell Abimelech that Sarah's his wife because evidently Sarah was a knockout. And when the king saw her, he wanted her for his harem, so he brings her. He doesn't touch her, he just brings her in the house. And all of a sudden, God gives this king Abimelech a dream. And it's just like it came out of a Clint Eastwood movie. I love this. God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, You're a dead man. 
Hold on. You're a dead man. Indeed, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken. She's, my, she's a man's wife. Ben Luke said, I didn't know this. This guy didn't tell me this. He said, she's my sister. So what happens? God says, well, I'll tell you what's, what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this guy to pray for you. This guy, Abram's going to pray for you. And when he does that, you're going to be released from this judgment. And so Abram comes and prays for this pagan king and acts as an advocate or an intercessor between the judgment that's coming on his life and this man. One more example, that's in the book of Daniel. Daniel has read the works of Jeremiah. And Daniel saw in those works that there was a certain appointed time for the city of Jerusalem to be desolated and to be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles. And he sees this, that there's a time limit to this. And then after that time limit happens, then the captivity of Jerusalem is going to be released and the people of Israel will be able to go home. And so when he sees this, it sends him into prayer. And he goes into prayer and he says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord God and made confession saying, O Lord God, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and those who keep His commandments. And he goes on and he prays for forgiveness. He says, in forgiveness, he says, Neither have we indeed heeded your servants, the prophets. Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Our fathers are the people of the land. You've driven them out. They've sinned against you. He's he's going back and he's basically confessing all of the sins of his fathers and he's standing as an advocate between judgment and God. Now, if you're into intercession and prophetic, this may be interesting, but Jeremiah as the prophet saw what was going to happen. But then it took a man who was an intercessor to pray that through. That's interesting. He acts as a midwife till birth comes of what God has already spoken. I don't know, this is another sermon and another track, but I'm telling you, if God speaks something in the prophetic, I do think we have a responsibility to pray and to birth that thing through. Because I have a friend who's a very sharp prophet, and he says, you may have problem with this, but just put it in your bag and save it for lunch later and chew on it. But He says, I believe a prophetic word is God's dream description for you. And then God places responsibility and demand upon your life to pray that thing in and live according to His precepts and walk it out. Y'all think about it. But this is what happened. Jeremiah saw the, the deliverance of Israel, so it sends Daniel to his knees as an intercessor who comes alongside his nation and prays as an intercessor, as an advocate, pushing this thing through. He is, in Greek, a parakletos. Parakletos means comforter, advocate, one who comes alongside. Okay. Are you all awake and had your caffeine say amen? amen? Let's dig a little deeper. In Scripture, we find in the New Testament two advocates. The first is Jesus. The Bible says the first advocate is Jesus. Notice John, 1 John. This is when John is older. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, thank God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. So it means if you and I sin, God forbid, we can go to the Father in the name of Jesus. And Jesus becomes our court attorney in heaven. And He argues the case for us. We have someone standing 24-7, 365, so to speak, in the courtrooms of heaven, ready to argue our case. Give Him a shout, amen? Come on. He is your defense attorney. He's the original one. He's the first. Why do we need a defense attorney? Because whether you believe it or not, all of us have been cursed. We all stand before the judgment seat of God cursed because we all sinned. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And 
we all are in a position of needing an advocate because we can't do it on our own. So Jesus comes and He stands before the courtroom of heaven and He becomes our defense attorney. Now here's the thing that, that I'd never seen before. I've always thought about it. Well, Jesus pled our case in the courtrooms of heaven, so to speak, with His actions. But, but really, he's, he's praying for mercy. and He's asking God the Father, you know, uh, Hans has been such a rotten guy, but please have mercy on him and let him off the hook this one time. But you know, when I started thinking of Jesus as an advocate, it goes so much deeper than that. Because a good attorney will be an expert in the law. And when you go to court with a great attorney, he should know way more law than you do. And he should help you navigate that court system and the laws to make your freedom and make your case be known. Okay? So Jesus, being the one who wrote the law on the mountain with Moses in the Old Testament. Come on somebody. Y'all going to preach with me today. Come on. Jesus was the one, I believe, who appeared in the burning bush to Moses. He's the one that was the rock following them in the wilderness. He's the one who was with Israel the whole time. So when God speaks, He speaks through His Word. His Word is Christ. So when He spoke and the law was written, Jesus was right there, one with the Father, writing the law. So when He came in the flesh in John... I'm about to blow up right now. Y'all hang on. And when He came in the flesh in John chapter 1, He knew exactly what He was doing. He was going to come down and He was going to fulfill every jot and tittle of the law that was left undone or unperformed by man. What man couldn't do, He was going to do. And then He came and He fulfilled every demand of the law. The penalty, fulfilled. The sacrifice, fulfilled. All of that He did in Himself. So that means when He comes to plead our case now, He doesn't say, Father, this guy, these guys are so rotten. Just get, let them by one more time, please. No, I think He comes up and He says, here's proof, exhibit A, it's my blood shed that says justice now is demanded. And justice says these people have to go free because every bit of their penalty has been taken on the cross and now they have been declared completely and forever innocent and not guilty and free. Somebody shout amen. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody give him a shout. So we're not just dependent upon the mercy of God. No, we've come into justice now, people. It says now the law's been taken care of, man. This thing's, you know what, we're throwing this out because everything's been met, everything has been decreed, everything's been satisfied. My people can now go ultimately free. So 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 Martin Lloyd Jones, a great Welsh preacher, he said, When I go up to someone and I ask, Are you a Christian? And that person answers and says, well, I'm trying. He said, I know immediately they're not. And they know nothing about being a Christian. Because being a Christian isn't in trying. Being a Christian is about trusting in the advocacy of the work of Jesus where you said, I've placed all my faith and confidence in Him. And now He's taken my case. And now He's wiped my slate clean. And it's not a trying, it's a standing. It's not a hoping, it, just hoping. It's a positional thing now that I am now saved because of the advocacy of Jesus. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Somebody says, well, uh, well, God would never punish people like that. Well, you're probably not a Christian either. Because you don't understand justice and the demands of the law. 
The law demands hell. The law demands punishment. The law demands everlasting punishment. This is why the work of Jesus is so profound. If there was no hell, if there was no law, everybody could do anything they want to. It's all situational ethics. Then we don't need a cross. We don't need a Savior. We don't need a gospel. We don't need a church. We might as well go home and grill out hamburgers. But because there is a hell and because there is a law and because there is justice and because there are penalties, because there is a courtroom of God, it demands, it's essential, it's, it's, it's our life's blood, man, on the line here. It's our eternal destiny on the line that now we need an advocate like never before. We need the best one, the only one able to walk in and take it all away. There's a second advocate. There's another one. He's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'll ask the Father and He'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. I'm giving you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. You've had me walking alongside with you. We've been day in and day out, guys. We've been around the campfire. I've been teaching. I've been healing the sick. I've been preaching the Word. We've been going to the temple. It's been awesome, but now I'm going away. But guess what? I'm sending someone right by your side again. And here's the beauty thing about it. He says, when this one comes, he will not be of a different sort. He says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another. Can we all say another? See, there's, there's two words in Greek that we need to parse here. One is heteros, which means another of a different kind. But that's not what's used here. The term here is alos, which means another of the same kind. So now there's another advocate coming to you who is not of a different substance, a different being necessarily. or a di- it, it, This is God and it's a Trinitarian mystery, but He said, I'm sending you another advocate who's going to come to your side as well. Okay, I want Sarah and I want Jackie to join me up here. This is called Spontaneous Preaching 101. Can't teach this. Okay, some say they look alike. Okay, y'all smile and look pretty and see if you look alike. Okay, this is my wife. This is my daughter. Okay, I need somebody. I need Mike up here. Come on, Mike. You're, you're the man in need today. You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for the Carter brothers, but I don't see them. I used them in the first service, and man, it was profound. Okay, here's the deal. Mike is, he's a Christian, but he needs a lot of help, like we all do. You need, you need someone to talk to. You need some when you go through the highs and the lows. You need somebody to lean upon. You need somebody to help you pray. You need somebody to correct you when you get out of the way a little bit. So Mike's walking the Christian life. Trying to. Trying to. (laughs) Okay. And then uh, let's let Sarah be Jesus to you. Okay. You turn around this way, and Sarah comes and puts her arm around you, and she's like, she's Jesus to you. She's your advocate. She's represented you in heaven. She's already taken your court case. So y'all are going to walk along now. And Sarah's counseling you. And she's encouraging you. And she's doing all that good stuff. And she, every now and then there's correction coming. Then y'all turn and walk the other way. Y'all hanging on with me during this live skit right here. And so, then you stop. And Jesus says, I'm going away. <laughs> and you go away. But then, another Hess... Raised in the same house, of the same hair color, of the same skin tone, same musical genes. Another Hess comes and puts her arm around you. And this becomes the Holy Spirit to you. And now y'all walk. Now y'all turn and walk the other way. And she's counseling you. And she's talking to you. And she's correcting you. And she's praying through you. Can somebody give me a shout now? Hallelujah. 
Thank you, my man. So, Jesus has gone away, but He says, I'm not sending somebody, a uh, third cousin down here. No, and this analogy breaks down. They always do with the Godhead, so just deal with it. He goes away, another of the same kind from the same household comes and takes on the job that Jesus was doing. Can y'all say amen? Thank y'all. And here's the amazing thing about Christianity is that we don't have to go to an idol and pray and offer food. We don't have to pray to a God that we, can, that, that we can't pronounce their name or they're, they're so mysterious that we just hope that one day we'll see this person and we hope that judgment will fall right for us one day. Or we are not involved in a religion where we have to follow a certain path of meditation and the eightfold path of Buddhism and we hope we get into heaven in the end. Or we don't follow Joseph Smith and we don't follow Charles Taze Russell and we're not the 144,000 in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah! But we have a religion where our Savior proved Himself by rising from the dead, and then He went back and won the court case in heaven, and now He sent His Spirit back down into the believer, and He's not just coming alongside this time, He's coming inside. Oh, hallelujah. Now He's coming inside, and now your advocate doesn't just show up when you pay Him. Now your advocate doesn't just show up when you have a court date. Now your advocate goes to bed with you at night, wakes up in the morning with you, eats breakfast with you, goes to work with you, sits out on the back porch with you. He's with you 24-7, 365. Woo! Come on somebody shout amen. I'm walking in Walmart, my advocate's with me. I go up to Golden Crow with those greased up yeast rolls tempting me, and my advocate's with me. Come on. I go up my backyard, mow my grass, advocate's with me. I show up this morning and preach, advocate's with me, downloading stuff for me to say. Hallelujah. Y'all show up at the healing rooms on Tuesday night, advocate shows up because he's in all of y'all. Then you get together and it's like exponential power. Then when y'all lay hands on people, it's not just this feeble hand, but now it's the hand of the advocate running through my body. Hallelujah. And now I'm, 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 and you know what he, you know, oh, come on back, Mike. Hallelujah. Every time Mike gets in trouble, Mike, Mike's seen some disappointments. I'm just going to make up some stuff. <laughs> let's say he, he wanted a certain position he didn't get it and he gets, he gets disappointed and, and, he, and he says yeah, I, sh- I deserve that it, I've, done, I've been here a long time and I've, I've done a lot of good stuff he's stepping in being his own advocate and this is when we get in trouble we've all done that but the Holy Spirit comes up and says hey Mike Remember the first advocate. That's all you need to look to. Because the first advocate stood for you and took care of all that. And now you just walk in that freedom. Oh, isn't that good? Man, that's good. Thank you. So when we try to step in and be our own advocate and we fight for our own piddly little things and our pride and our gets hurt and God says, step up, step back, man. I've created you far more wonderfully than you can ever or will ever know. Because you know what? Where were you when I flung the stars out in the heavens as he told Job? Where were you when I called Leviathan out of the sea? You don't know the plans and purposes I have for you. They're so far beyond you right now. You're just walking with a limited field of vision. But I'm telling you what, I've already fought your battle and now let me have my way in you. And let me come and point you back to the one that becomes the centering point of all of our lives. Okay, I'm going to close with five points. Quickly. Five things about the advocate. Number one, the advocate is, the spirit is the other counselor. Remember, not another of a different kind, but one of the same kind. 
He's so one with Jesus and the Father. It's a, myst- it's a mystery. Matter of fact, they're so close. Jesus said, this is King James. Jesus said, my Father and I will come sup with you. Meaning, this relationship is so close, we're coming home with you and going to come in and have dinner or supper. And we're sitting down having supper together. This is how close we are and how close we are in you. He's the other counselor. Second thing about the the advocate is that he is our teacher now. He is our teacher. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, and the Father sent in my name will teach you all things and He'll remind you of everything I have said to you. Third thing, the comforter or the advocate now is the one who testifies to the first advocate. He said He wouldn't come. Jesus said the advocate's not coming to talk about Himself. He's coming to talk about me and what I've accomplished And what my advocacy means in your life. Fourth thing. The Spirit comes and sometimes turns into the prosecuting attorney. Bible says in John 16, when He comes, He will judge the world wrong or prove the world to be wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Spirit comes to convict people. The Spirit is working all over the world to bring people to Christ. And so He's working in the hearts of people to convict them of sin. This is why it's so uncomfortable to preach on sin or why the world hates the church. They love the church as long as we approve of everything they do. But when we speak the truth, it offends But guess what? The Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin. Now there are mission guys working right now in India and China especially who go in and their tactic is this. They go into an unreached village and they start meeting people and they look to see whom the Holy Spirit is already convicting. And if they don't find that person, they go on to the next. Because their theology is that the Holy Spirit is already convicting people even in pagan cultures. And those are the ones that are most ripe for the gospel. And those are the ones they'll present the message to. And then they'll build churches and it's going like wildfire. So we don't have to save Elizabeth City. The Holy Spirit is already out there working His work. He's already in your neighborhood bringing people, convincing them they're wrong. Wow. He's already working to pull them to Christ. And the way He does that is to provoke and convince them they're wrong, which causes one of two things to happen. It causes a hardening to happen that a person will walk on, or it causes a crushing to happen. And that person will relent, and that person will repent, and they'll get saved. Through those doors of conviction comes salvation. And though He doesn't come to condemn the believer, because, because condemnation has already been lifted off of us, he does come to provoke us sometimes and convict us when we step off. He comes and he says, hey Hans, come on man. What's a good friend do? A good friend comes and knows you deep enough that you can share stuff. I went to a meeting years ago in D.C. with a bunch of pastors we didn't hardly know any of them. And I had a, a pastor friend who was retired. And one of the guys in the group, it was a sincere request. But he said, let's share our hearts with one another. When we got out in the car, my friend, the older guy, looked at me and said, I ain't sharing nothing with those guys. <laughs> and I understand where he was coming from. He didn't know these people. You can't show up at meeting one and pour your heart out. It takes relationship and a deepening of a fellowship and a trust So God wants to walk with us like that. It's what the Holy Spirit is. When we get so intimate with Him and we walk with Him and then we share, He knows all of our hearts. And then what's a really good friend do? That won't hurt your feelings. You'll still be friends, but you can take it. So when they come up and say, Hey man, dude, you got to get it together in this part of your life. You're having a train wreck here, man. you got to get it together. And you'll take it from a friend. 
That's what the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes he comes in and he says, hey, Hans, this is not the right way. He's the divine GPS, the spirit, the final thing, the spirit guides. He becomes the divine heavenly GPS system that's locked in us. John chapter 16, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So like we have the GPS now, now hardly anyone uses it in their, on their car, they all have it on the phone. But nonetheless, we can ask Siri, and Siri's gotten me in some messed up places, man. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's calibrated to the GPS, you know, global positioning systems. Well, the Holy Spirit comes inside us as an advocate to lead and guide us, but He's calibrated to the righteousness and the things of God. So when He comes, He starts pinging us in and and honing us into the perfect will of God in our lives. So we need to listen to the Holy Spirit within us. I hate that redirecting. How many has ever got the redirecting GPS message? Recalculating. Maybe mine was redirecting. Or, you're just lost. (laughs) Doesn't Siri say something like that if you get like completely off the... No, I've heard somebody say Siri's just like, you're lost. (laughs) You ever been there? Go to my hometown with me. Siri cannot get you to certain places. But the Holy Spirit comes... And He knows every intimate detail of your life. He knows all of your past. And He knows all of your future. Oh, hallelujah. And so He can hone you in and guide you perfectly into the will of God. This is why praying in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost is so important. We pray the perfect will of God. And we pray mysteries in the Spirit. And I think we pray prophetically what's in front of us. When we start praying in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost, we don't even know the things that are coming down. But man, when we start praying in the Spirit, the Spirit starts de- praying through His GPS coordinates and realizes, uh-oh, there's a, there's a caution flag up here. There's a bridge out over here. There's a wreck on the highway here. Y'all have three more hours? Okay. Yeah. That's what I heard. This is so important that we pray in the Spirit and we allow that download to happen of the Holy Spirit in our lives because He's praying things out in front of us that we don't know yet. He's speaking mysteries in the Spirit. We don't know how we, we ought to pray as we, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession through us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, now, you know, taking the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and all that jazz. And then he says, and praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I believe that means praying in the Holy Ghost. Allowing the Spirit to pray through you. Because Jude said, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So when we pray in the Spirit, our faith is built up. GPS coordinates downloaded. We're making intercession that we don't even know the perfect, the perfect way to pray, but He knows how to pray it. And now He's praying through us. Oh man, this is good stuff. Okay, so I'm going to close with this because we got to go cook hot dogs. How do you act when you know a special guest is coming to your home? I don't know. In our house, it's like Jackie's on point, man. When, when we know someone's coming, it's like we all get into clean mode. Yard has to be mowed. Floors have to be mopped. Bathrooms have to be clean. Sheets have to be changed. Candles lit. Christmas lights on. We still have our Christmas tree up. Don't judge me. And then everything's on point because when we have people coming... We want to provide the best environment for them. Now, now let's amp that up a little bit. What if we know it's like a dignitary coming? What if we have like an ambassador or like a senator? Or What if the president decides to come to Camden? Hallelujah. I think we would make sure everything was in order. 
We're going to try to fix some broken light bulbs and some stuff hanging down and some. How much more if God came to visit? How much more if God says, Well, guess what? He has. He has come inside your being when you, I believe, when you repented and accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and makes his abode with you. But yet, sometimes we live with the windows broken, the lights out, the yard unmowed, the laundry piled up, and I'm getting in your junk right now. But with the Holy Spirit living in us, we should, we should, it, it's like we have a guest and he's the greatest guest of all. We don't take him everywhere. He goes with us everywhere, but there are certain places I don't want the Holy Spirit to know I, I go to or have been to or want to go in the future. I'm not taking him in a strip club. I'm not taking him into certain movies. I'm not taking him into certain environments because I don't want to be in those environments. He can find us anywhere. But I want, to, I want to watch how I walk in the anointing. Because some things, well, I'm, I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to get too deep here. Someone's living inside you and it's the greatest helper and advocate you'll ever he, Hey, listen. Loyal the Hammer Stanley don't have nothing on this dude, Right? <laughs> Perry Mason, forget about it. It's the Holy Ghost living inside you. Come on, let's all stand. Wow. Somebody say, my advocate. Hallelujah. Come on, say, my advocate. Punch your neighbor and look at him right in the eyes and say, I have an advocate. Father, we thank You today for the Word. Oh, Lord, it's so rich. We thank You for the Word. I pray, Lord, that everyone gets this. They go and You work Your your revelation and Your wonders in their heart. And God, we're going to feed on this Word this week. That the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He's our comforter. He's our counselor. He's our helper. He's the one who comes alongside. He's our best friend. Lord, I thank You for this. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, if there's anyone in here who's not serving you, they've never committed their life to you. They're, they're still in that mode of trying to be a Christian. I pray they surrender that this morning. And Lord, they, they fully embrace your work and who you are in Jesus' name.